All right, folks, we're finally up to number eight in the Noble Eightfold Path, and some of you will be glad that this is finishing because I'm not getting as many views on these Noble Eightfold Path videos as I normally do. So the last one is what my teacher calls the right balanced state. Now, he's the only one who calls it that. Uh, most people call it right concentration, although I've also seen, let's say, right meditative absorption, right union, and right single-mindedness. The word that they are all translating differently is samadhi. And it's the same word in Pali and Sanskrit this time. And samadhi is a funny word. Now, here is how early Buddhists described samadhi. This is the supposed words of the Buddha. There is the case where a monk, quite withdrawn from sensuality, withdrawn from unskillful mental qualities, enters and remains in the first jhana. Rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. With the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluations, he enters and remains in the second jhana. Rapture and pleasure born of composure, unification of awareness, free from directed thought and evaluation, internal assurance. With the fading of rapture, he remains equanimous. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that word right. Mindful and alert and senses pleasure with the body. He enters and remains in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare equanimous, there's that word again, and mindful, he has a pleasant abiding. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, as with the earlier disappearance of elation and distress, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana, purity of equanim equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain, this is called right concentration. Now, jhana is a Pali word that is uh, the same as the Sanskrit word dhyana, which is the same as the Chinese word chan, which was translated into Japanese as zen. So zen is jhana. So zen Buddhists are jhana Buddhists, I guess you could say. So you'd expect zen Buddhists to be all about the jhanas, you know, number one, two, three, four, but they aren't. The problem for me, and let me see if I can explain this as clearly as possible, with these jhana states and numbering them one, two, three, and four, and, and leveling them, you know, and making a kind of a hierarchy of, of these states, is how do you judge it? I suppose you could kind of look at your situation right now as you're sitting or whatever you're doing and say, is this rapture born of withdrawal? But I don't know what rapture and pleasure, I guess that's how he says it, uh, born of withdrawal feels like, so I have to kind of guess. But then I'm just kind of comparing my mental state as it is now with an idea of, of something that is evoked by the words that I just read or that I heard from somebody else. Or maybe if I've accomplished that, maybe if I figure I've gone beyond that, then I can kind of compare my state in that next moment, you know, after I've gone beyond jhana number one, with what I remember of jhana number one and say, is this, uh, what does it say, uh, equanimous and mindful? Is this pleasant abiding? I, I don't even know what pleasant abiding means. And how would I know if I've accomplished jhanas one or two or, or three or four or whichever one I'm, I'm doing? Well, I suppose I could ask my teacher and say, you know, here, here's what happened to me and I could describe it and then he could say, well, yeah, that sounds like jhana number two or jhana number three and then I could choose to believe him or not believe him. And he would be kind of confirming or denying my accomplishments, my meditative accomplishments. I hope I'm conveying this properly because to me this is the the big problem with all of this it just makes no sense you're comparing something real in the here and now with an imagination of you know whatever these words evoke in your mind or with somebody else's assessment of you and that just doesn't make any sense to me and it never has now i suppose by saying this i am questioning you know the words of the buddha but i think that's okay because the buddha said in the kalama sutra to question what he said and and, and evaluate it and i evaluate that and i find it lacking and 
I know I'll probably get a little bit of uh, hatred in the comments section for saying this, but I have my doubts about the Pali Canon, about whether it actually preserves the, the words of the Buddha properly, uh, or whether it preserves kind of a later tradition of what you know people made up around what they remembered of the Buddha. Now in the Zen tradition there's a totally different way of working with these things and I want to read to you something called uh, part of something called Jijuyu Zanmai and Zanmai means Samadhi. This is by Dogen, this is, comes as a section of Bendowa. Dogen himself didn't separate this section of Bendowa out and consider it a different thing, but later people in the Soto tradition did, and, and so it's often chanted. This is part of a, a translation I made because I was uh, going to talk about this Jiju Yuzanmai in Europe, and I wanted to make a version of it that was really clear that I could say in English to people who didn't speak English as a native language but understood English, so all the sentences are very short and choppy. Uh, but th I think this is a little bit easier to comprehend for somebody who doesn't speak English in, as a native language and might be easier for people who do speak English as a native language. When you practice Zazen with the whole body, speech, and mind, even for a short time, the entire universe immediately becomes the posture of Buddha. The whole sky immediately becomes enlightenment. It enables all beings everywhere, in heaven, on earth, or in hell, to increase their dharma joy of their original nature. It enables all beings to be Buddhas. It renews their awakening. Together, all beings in every direction, in every realm, become clear in body and mind. They realize great liberation. Their original face appears. Thus, the supreme, complete, and perfect awakening of all things returns to you when you sit zazen. You and this awakening assist each other intimately in ways that cannot be perceived. That's important. You drop off body and mind absolutely without fail. At this time, grass, trees, walls, tiles, and fences carry out Buddha work. Everyone and everything receives the benefits of the movement of wind and water caused by the practice of zazen. The influence of Buddha helps them realize the enlightenment that they already possess. Though they do not perceive this, it is true. All of you who receive this wind and fire spread the Buddha influence of original enlightenment. All who live and talk with you also share this virtue. They too spread and circulate this truth throughout the universe. This truth is limitless. It never ceases. It cannot be understood. It cannot be measured. However, when you are sitting zazen, you do not notice this. Your perceptions do not interfere with it. This is because this stillness is not something you have created. You directly experience the stillness that already exists. Within this stillness, you are enlightenment itself. Many believe that practice and enlightenment are two different things. They think that practice and enlightenment can be perceived separately. They are not. Enlightenment is not associated with perception. Our human thoughts and our human feelings are deluded. They cannot reach the standard of enlightenment. Mind and object appear and disappear within stillness. This takes place in the realm of the samadhi of receiving and using the self. Not even a speck of dust is moved. Nothing is destroyed, and yet Buddha work and Buddha influence occur. Grasses, trees, and walls praise and proclaim this truth for the sake of living beings. It does not matter whether these living beings are ordinary or saintly. In turn, all living beings praise and proclaim the truth for the sake of grass, trees, and walls. It doesn't matter whether these grasses, trees, and walls are ordinary or saintly. Awareness of self lacks nothing. Awareness of the external world lacks nothing. Both are concrete, real experience. Both are always happening. Realization occurs at every moment. Realization is practiced endlessly. If only one person sits zazen, even for a short time, zazen is one with all existence and completely fills all of time. It is mystical cooperation. It guides all beings and all things in the past, present, and future. Each moment you sit zazen is complete practice and complete realization. That's also a key point. If all of the Buddhas came together and combined all of their wisdom to try to calculate the goodness of one person sitting zazen for one moment, they could not come close. So that's how Dogen sees it. Dogen doesn't talk about levels of enlightenment or, or jhana states or, you know, ranking them one, two, and three, and four. He says even the act of sitting zazen when you feel completely crappy about it and it feels like nothing is happening at all and it's the worst zazen in the world, which mine was about an hour ago this morning, even that is complete, perfect, unsurpassed enlightenment. Even that is right samadhi. In 108 Gates of Dharma Illumination, which we've been looking at, he says, this is Dogen again, 
right balance state or right concentration or right samadhi is a gate of dharma illumination for with it we attain undistracted samadhi and again he's talking about just plain old zazen whether you feel like it or not this is samadhi in the 37 elements of bodhi however he gets really tricky so i'm going to have to parse a lot of this out and i'm going to have to look at my notes a lot he says, right balance as a branch of the path is to get free of Buddhist ancestors and to get free of right balance. It is others being well able to discuss. It is to make nose holes by cutting out the top of the head. It is the twirling of an Udumbra flower inside the right Dharma eye treasury. It is the presence inside the Udumbra flower of a hundred thousand faces of Mahakashapa breaking into a smile. Having used this state of vigorous activity for a long time, a wooden dipper is broken. Thus, right balance, or right samadhi, is six years of floundering in the wilderness and a night in which the flower opens. It is when the great fire at the end of a kalpa is blazing and the great thousand-fold world is being totally destroyed, just to follow circumstances. That was a mouthful. So let's go through it one by one, and I'm looking at my notes here. I take notes on these things for you people who think I only work three hours a week. When he says right balance is to be free of the Buddhist ancestors and, and get free of right balance, that means we no longer are having to refer to the Buddhist ancestors, uh, you know, words we've heard in the past, to, um, you know, stories we've heard or descriptions we've heard. And right balance, we, we no longer have to refer to some idea of right balance. We know it for sure at that moment. But when he says stuff about uh, nose holes cutting off the top of the head, uh, Nishijima Roshi says that nostrils are a symbol of liveliness, you know, something being truly alive. And he says, right balance is a lively state realized by ceasing the more sophisticated mental activities, i.e. cutting off the top of the head, uh, that take us away from the here and now. Okay. And the bit about the Udumbra flower, the Udumbra flower is a symbol of something unreal. Uh, uh, if there's any botanists in the audience, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I heard it is the Udumbra is a plant that has a flower that, that just looks like leaves. And because of this, the ancient Indians thought, oh, here's a, here's a plant that doesn't have a flower. So Udumbra flower meant a non-existent flower, an imaginary flower. And when he says twirling the Udumbra flower, that's a reference to the Buddha's uh, moment when he gave Mahakashapa Dharma transmission, the very first Dharma transmission, and recognized Mahakashapa, his student, as being his equal. So he twirled a flower and Mahakashapa's face broke into a smile. And that's what that reference is about. But the reason it's an imaginary flower is because Dogen is trying to emphasize that we don't have to be aware of our own enlightenment. It can even be this invisible flower that we don't even see. Uh, a wooden dipper being broken means that the Buddhist practitioner has become completely free from conditions that restricted his or her ability to understand and appreciate his, that real moment. And that's a paraphrase of Nishijima Roshi's uh, footnote on that. Uh, falling among weeds for six years, uh, uh, floundering is uh, is what it says in the other translation, is uh, and and then one night of uh, the flower opening. This is a reference to Buddha's six years of wandering in the wilderness and kind of not getting anywhere. But then one night he just gets it all and and makes perfect sense of everything. His enlightenment experience. And the stuff at the end about the Great Kalpa Fire is based on a koan, or a story, old Buddhist story, that goes like this. A monk asked Master Daizui Hoshin, they say that when the Great Fire at the end of a kalpa, a kalpa is an incredibly, incredibly long time, is blazing, the great thousandfold world will be totally destroyed. I wonder whether this place will be destroyed. The Master says, it will be destroyed. The monk says, if that is so, we should just follow circumstances. The master says we should just follow circumstances. And when he says this place will be destroyed, he doesn't mean, you know, the Los Feliz district of Los Angeles, where I happen to be sitting right now. Uh, he means this place, me. Will me be destroyed? Will this, will this uh, awareness be destroyed? And the master says it will be destroyed, which just sounds pretty... You know, that sounds like it's something that doesn't last forever, which, you know, other versions of uh, Buddhist philosophy say it does last forever. 
And the monk says, I will just follow circumstances. And the master affirms this, I will just follow circumstances. So no matter what happens, you just follow circumstances. You, you follow what is necessary at this moment and do that. So that's a lot of stuff. Uh, maybe people have questions about it. I don't know. We'll see. Did that make any sense? I don't know. It made sense to me. I worked on it for a while. But if it didn't make sense to you, let me know. You can donate to me making sense if you want to on the link that you're seeing below on your screen. Or if you're on YouTube, the links are direct and in the description below. That is how I make most of my living these days, and I thank you very much for your support. If you're having financial trouble, as always, don't donate to me. I'm not desperate, but the reason I'm not desperate is because of all you who keep donating, so thank you very much. That really helps. That makes me able to pay the rent, which i got to do today, and uh, everything else that happens. So thank you very much. Have a good time all the time. See you later. Bye.